Uh, this is, uh, I'm Sam, aka Perlox. This is my uh, daily stream. Um, I attempt to do it daily. Uh, of course, there are conflict issues on certain days, but that's the mentality I'm approaching with. This is day 25. Um, overall, doing awesome. Um, been streaming a bunch, working out like crazy. Um, and this stream is helping me focus a lot on my D&D meetup group. So super exciting. Um, let's see here. I more, like more housekeeping stuff. Uh, I'm currently running the fine dining, uh, one shot. I ran the first one this past week. That's what I'm going to be focused on here tonight. I'm running the second one, uh, next week, Wednesday, I believe. Um, and then I also need to get some more games scheduled. The meetup group has, um, let's see how many members now, 328. Uh, I'm getting, I think it's averaging about one to two members a day. Um, there are too many members at this point for me to really run enough games to kind of appease everyone. Um, so I am in the process of uh, searching for more DMs here in Denver that might be interested in uh, helping me run occasional games. So I'm sort of meeting with DMs right now and then kind of coming up with a format for how those games will be posted um, on meetup.com. So if you're in the Denver area and you want to play, um, join the meetup. Uh, but you should also stop watching because I'm going to be spoiling an entire one shot. So uh, if you're planning on playing, of course. Um, meeting with the DM tomorrow for that purpose. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, one minor random note is I'm listening to a podcast, or just finished a podcast, with uh, Tim Ferriss and Jocko Will Willinick, and then I'm listening to Jocko's actual podcast, and they brought up something really interesting, which was um, there's a sort of loose connection between um, military planning. So Jocko is a, like, uh, like he was like a lifetime... Uh, military guy like uh, he was in the battle of Ramadi he was like leading um, troops in there and he was talking about military planning and it, and it actually kind of funnily enough sounded a little bit like DM planning where um, you want to come up with a, a structure to what it is you're about to do say this one shot that I'm running but you don't want to make it overly complex or overly rigid. It needs a lot of good DMing and a lot of good leadership on a battlefield. I think you can make that connection as like, it lies in your actual skill set in the moment, how tactical you are, what your knowledge is, really are you making good decisions and tying it back to whatever the overall objective is. So just sort of like a weird side note um, that I kind of want to explore. Uh, I'll finish listening to his podcast, see if there's anything else that he mentions, but I just thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, okay, let's jump over to the one shot because there's actually quite a bit of stuff to go through. Um, yeah, it should be good. All right. Um, so this one shot is the uh, one shot number six. So this is the sixth unique story that I've developed. It's called Fine Dining. Um, and yeah, let's, well, let me, let me just give a super high level overview. So basically the party gets the deed to a restaurant. They are prepping for opening night. They need to get a killer recipe to make sure that opening night goes well and that their restaurant kind of flourishes into the future. Go on an adventure um, to meet this legendary chef. She wants something in return. They go to um, get the uh, recipe. Then they come back and, um, and then they, they, have opening night, make the food, and they do some miscellaneous type of roles at the very end. Um, overall, I think uh, on Thursday when I ran this game, I think it went pretty well. The party, it was a party of six um, with f four new players and two that were returning. Um, and I think it, really, it went well. It was fun. Um, one thing I'm noticing is I'm getting better at um, NPC player dialogue going back and forth, which is one of my biggest weaknesses as a DM. I'm just not super great a lot of the times at like coming up with the right thing to say or um, I don't know, it just really puts me in the, puts me on the spot. So that has been a weakness, but I think this meetup is actually starting to show some progress there because I the, this last game and the game before, 
the dialogue, the back and forth, it was just, it was really good. Um, there were some really, some moments where I really connected with some of the players um, playing the characters and stuff like that. So exciting. Hopefully I'm not jinxing it and this next week goes terrible, but um, yeah, seems cool so far. Um, all right, so let me copy this down really quick so I don't, I can talk about it in the appropriate section. Um, uh, I've got two vocabulary words. So this is a couple random things. As a DM, I'm trying to not just get better at DMing, but get better at other things that are sort of related to it. Um, for instance, uh, vocabulary words like teaching myself new words that I could use at the table. Um, learning history and then translating that into stories. That's also interesting. I'm also, this is sort of a weird random thing, but I'm, I'm learning, um, I'm, I'm re, kind of relearning some sign language because I met this guy at Hexacon pa this past weekend. He's sort of exploring in Denver uh, what the what the sort of audience is for deaf and hard of hearing players. And he's looking for someone that may be interested in um, running games for them. So I'm, I'm personally just interested in that. I think that could be a fun experience. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how it'll work if, you know, maybe I just DM like normal and I have someone there that's interpreting it and doing sign language. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe I can learn it fast enough that I could actually run a game and use sign language. But that, that does seem like a stretch. Um, but anyway, I, I did today learn a, ABCs all the way through Z um, in sign language. It actually wasn't very hard. My next step will be to uh, relearn the numbers because I had learned them at one point and then learn some actual um, words, you know. So we'll see how that goes. But anyway, for vocabulary, we've got ramshackle. It's used in the story text um, right down here. And then the new one I'm going to add for this coming week is uh, surreptitiously. I think I said that right. Used to describe Will Gilda's escape from the pub. So there's a spot down here when it's not really an escape, but... Um, she says to the party, when they ask her about this legendary chef, she goes, shh, it's a secret. And then I can describe her as surreptitiously slipping out of the, out of the pub. So that'll be the, the spot that I'm using that new vocabulary word. Um, all right, so starting top to bottom here. Um, they are in the village of Spreedwall. That is the, the name. This is kind of what I'm imagining it looks like. Um, one thing I explored today was what a population uh, would look like in this village. So right now I've got it at 450. Um, I'm basing this off of um, a quick lookup that I did on Google Maps. I've got some extended family that live in a small town in northern Minnesota called Tower. Um, so if we, whoop, if we zoom in here, let's figure out it's a cook. No, Tower right here. So you can see this is... Um, I flip it over. I believe if I tower had like a population of like 500, maybe population of 500 ish. Um, so I, I w that's sort of what I was going off of. Tower feels like about the right size. Um, maybe a little, maybe a little less for Spreedwall. Um, but anyway, one thing I was trying to figure out uh, just this afternoon was what is a population 450 town kind of like? What is what? How does the growth rate look like? Um, in the previous stream, Dice Chuck brought up a good point: is he, you should when you just when you define the population of this village, you should define whether or not uh, the population is increasing or decreasing. Um, and so, I think Spreedwall is doing well, and some of the reasons are the current adult generation is favorable towards rural living. Rural, rural, rural living provides good wages from farming, hunting, and gathering. Large cities are facing um, significant challenges like crime and disease that's pushing some people out. Um, Spreedwall has a good reputation. It's located within a stable kingdom um, and is protected by some of the larger nearby cities, so people also feel like it's a safe place to live. Um, so that could explain why population's 450 and increasing. Um, I was also looking up this um, medieval fertility rates. What I was trying to kind of explore here was... Um, how fast would a village grow if you were just looking at like people having um, babies and not really like people coming to there, like moving there? Um, so some of the things I got, and again, this isn't done. This is just sort of a rough, giving you a rough idea. I didn't do a ton of research, but um, 
this article talked about most women having six to seven pregnancies in their lifetime. There was about a 50% chance of going to term, like actually having the baby. Um, there's about a 50% chance of survive, the child surviving to adulthood. So we would expect about one to two children to survive in adulthood from the six to seven pregnancies, something around there. Um, so anyway, I, I did a little spreadsheet work. Um, so you can, you can see I've got it through, you know, I, I, what I was imagining is nine men, nine women, uh, two elderly, two children, they, a population of 22, they go out, start this little village of Spreedwall. What does it look like um, after 36 years? And the reason I did 36 is because I'm just choosing kind of the, the current um, ages for uh, adulthood, 18, and then another set of 18. Um, so the, we're starting with, and of course this doesn't take into account like adults dying from whatever disease or getting injured in the forest or something and, and not being able to make it back. But but anyway, the point was is I, I just kind of wanted to see like what does it look like? You know, like you can see here that the adult population very slowly kind of increases, whereas the ch the number of children in the village increases f pretty fast. Um, very, you know, here and there, every I was just doing every 10 years, a couple more people move into the elderly category or probably more accurately the non-reproductive category. Um, and then what is the, you know, the growth in population over 36 years? We're going from 22 to 65. Again, totally rough. I'm not super good at math. <laughs> this is me just creating some formulas, trying to work things out. So you can see there's a formula in there. So uh, really quick, it's taking the, uh, let's see, current adult population divided by two because half are men, half are women, um, multiplying it by one third. The reason for that is because uh, if you look back at um, six to seven pregnancies in a lifetime, you know, is looking at an age range from like, I'm guessing technically like probably 13 to 40-ish. Um, if you divide that then by six to, you know, six, seven area, that's about having a child about once every three years, multiply that by um, 0 0.5 because half of them are not even going to be successful pregnancies, add it to the additional children. And so that's oops, that's sort of how I'm, I'm doing that. Um, yeah, and there's some other additional calculations. But anyway, um, I got some general percentages out of that spreadsheet. 5 to 15% of your community would be elderly or non-reproductive. 30 to 40% would be adults, 40 to 50% would be children. And then I found one article that sort of um, sort of taught, met those same numbers. So I, I kind of feel like I was moving in the right direction. You can see here, zero to 15, 40 to 50%. This is a, a thousand AD in the Norse, Norse lands. Um, 16 to 50 years old was in the Reno, you know, a little over 30%. Um, so anyway, I can now take those percentages and put them into the 450 figure and get a get you know some idea of like how many adults are there, how many men, how many women, how many children, how many elderly, um, stuff like that. So kind of interesting. Um, the other piece of that that is just fascinating to me too is like because I, I'm guessing this doesn't apply at all anymore in today's society, but maybe or maybe certain parts of the world. I don't know, but like it'd be weird to live in like a small community, say of like like Tower, Minnesota, and like the majority of the people that are living there are children. Um, that's just kind of interesting to think about. Like the city almost feels like it's it's run by really young people because it's so grueling and most of the, the elders don't make it. Um, kind of makes me think like that's why, you know, you you should listen to your elders, especially like it was really significant back then because they there weren't many of them. They didn't live very long. Um, and children, young people are so kind of erratic and chaotic and they don't know a lot, they don't have a lot of experiences. So like having the majority of your people be children is probably kind of dangerous. Um, they can make some dr rash decisions and things like that, so. Um, yeah, interesting. All right, uh, the restaurant used to be called Greenlance after the Greenlance family. The last owner was Ned Greenlance, last of his name, who was killed in his early 30s during a regional skirmish. The restaurant passed to his closest friend, Mr. Benji Greenwald, who also died recently and left it to his son, Mr. Jerry Greenwald. It was mostly used as storage for the last 30 years. This is just some backup DM ammunition in case a related question gets asked. It didn't come up in Thursday's game. Neither did this one. The two battle axes crossed inside above the fireplace. 
were owned by the Greenlands family and have not been and have both seen combat. They are called Hawk and Lightning. Um, added that little note because I describe it in uh, further down um, on the off chance that they're like, hey, can I take one of these into combat or on the adventure? They totally could. Um, I just wanted to have a little backstory for them. Uh, Will Gilda is an amateur alchemist training under Master Genwin Adenius. Uh, she will be found most days working in his store, out gathering reagents at a local pub or at home sleeping. Uh, Marma goes by the other aliases, uh, Solir, Thalys, Zaria, Godena, and Kylia. Um, that, uh, that is supposed to be one of these things where all of my one-shots, they're very straightforward. Players don't have to really worry about too much backstory and stuff if they don't want to. What I've found is that the, the complicated story that I've created originally called The Rust, um, it's like overly complicated for a one-shot, for newbies showing up to a meetup. Um, whereas when I ran like the Winter Christmas special, very simple, straightforward, go out, recover some stolen toys, kill the bad guys, take it back to Neverwinter, and there's not much backstory. And that game went really well. People enjoyed it, you know. Uh, one of the lessons I've been learning is like, it's not about me as the DM, it's really about the players. And the players, especially when they're newbies, don't need much. You know, they, they just want to roll some dice and laugh and socialize and kill some bad guys. Um, however, I do a little bit of this just for myself because I love coming up with this shit. Um, so anyway, there's supposed to be some teasers in all of my one-shots. For instance, Marma goes by other aliases. Why does she go by other aliases? Totally unclear right now. Um, there may be a one-shot in the future where players who are interested in, in learning more about this stuff, they could attend that one shot and, uh, and learn more about this Marma character who they actually don't know what her real name is or why she, you know, is she, you know, hiding from someone or whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, Spreedal is what is known as a bookless city. The Duchess of Harlington demanded cities under her rule to turn in all books to her master library. This was punishment for a particularly scathing portrayal of her family's realm by an author who is no longer alive. They are currently in the tedious process of destroying or censoring every book which even hints at monarchical rule being less than a perfect system of governance. Uh, the one exception, of course, uh, was a select group of religions and their religious texts which were allowed to remain untouched. Uh, the success of the recipe depending on one roll will that will you change that up next time? Yes. Well, I don't know. That it's at the bottom of the document. I'm definitely going to talk about it. Um, I have not decided on whether or not that was a bad thing. Um, because, and I'll get to this, but the the ending went well. It was fun. There was a lot of laughs. It did kind of get screwed up by that one roll having all that pressure sort of hinged on it, but. Um, yeah, it's sort of to be determined yet. Um, okay, so the only reason this bookless city thing is added in here, um, it exists really as a DM protection for myself. <laughs> in the in the case that the players want to scour the city for other recipes or something, I just I don't really want them to waste time doing that. If this was a non one shot like a long term campaign, I probably wouldn't have added a detail like this. I would let them do like whatever. Um, but since it's a one shot, since we're really time constrained, um, like I've noted, it feels like a cop out, but it also feels like a necessity. So. Um, this is something I'm probably going to come back to over time and think about maybe better ways to handle it, but for now I'm just putting it in as sort of a protection for myself. Um, Alright, so then we've got the actual game kicking off. Um, and I guess... I guess I'll go through it because I might, I might kick something up or a memory or something, so... Um, I did select a random player. This was sort of a new thing. I generally... In these meetups, since they're new players, I, I try to avoid, and I'm going to mention this some more later, I try to avoid singling people out because I don't want people to show up and feel um, singled out. I don't want them to feel like unnecessarily pressured or something. Um, so when I say random player, I'm really sort of watching the people at the table and trying to figure out, okay, who are the ones here that are really self-confident and would play along and not feel um, you know, burdened by, the, by being singled out? Um, so I chose Corin. He and I think that was really good. It was a good selection. He um, did a good job of multiple times throughout this story, really playing along and and uh, and just being a good sport. So I was really appreciative of that. So we'll use his name. Um, 
Corin is standing in front of you, holding a, a piece of old parchment. You're all staring at it silently, unbelieving, grimacing, in wonderment and shocked. Three days ago, you left on an adventure, almost got yourselves killed, returned with the kidnapped child, and Corin here was supposed to return with your, your, with your reward, 500 gold pieces. But instead, he's holding the deed to some ramshackle building in town. No pouch of gold, not even a shiny silver for your trouble. Well, that's not entirely true. He's holding a shiny silver key, but you know what I mean. Mr. Grinwald apparently never had the money. All he had was this deed and offered it forward as the only source of repayment. So you begrudgingly went and checked it out. It's run down, a little ugly from the outside, and the location's not great, but it does have some potential. It's spacious, made of old dark hardwood, strong counters, chandeliers, a large fireplace with a massive bear rug sprawled out before it, two ancient axes crossed above the mantle. It definitely has potential, and while it may not be your specialty, you determine after a few days of financial wizardry that with minimal investment, it could turn a decent profit in just a few months' time. That, of course, was after realizing that no one, no one else in town wants to buy it from you, and you'll still be expected to pay taxes on it in the coming season, so turning a profit is kind of a necessity. Uh, I added a little note here, don't say anyway here, because I accidentally said it right here, and then I said anyway again right here. And uh, it was just a minor thing, but I hated that I did that. Um, so you hire some help, and Mr. Grinwald even throws in an hour or two here and there. He seems much happier now, probably because his daughter is back, but he did seem awfully happy to get rid of this restaurant. Anyway, you have people working on the leaky roof, the creaky doors, the groaning floorboards, cleaning the counters, and washing the dishes. Opening night is only a couple weeks away, but you're still lacking one critical thing. But before we get to that, let's take care of some business. Before you can run a restaurant, there are some important decisions that need to be made. So this is where, um, and I've never started a game like this before, at least not one of the one-shots. So instead of jumping right into some role-playing or some rolling dice or whatever, um, I had them do some more of a creative exercise, and I kind of wanted to see how this went. So the first question is, number one, what is, your rest what is the name of your restaurant? Um, we probably spent, I'd say, two or three minutes on this one question. Um, Consolation Prize was the first name that got thrown out. Um, and then Corin, who was playing a holy character with a god, uh, threw out the name Roydricks, which I believe was on his sweatshirt or t-shirt or something. Um, so they ended up going with Roydricks, which I think is actually a great name for a restaurant or a bar or something. Just sounds pretty legit. Um, so I think that was okay. Um, are you going to be operating above board or partaking in any shady business practices? So this is to, in my mind, a kind of a fun question, but I think I'm going to scrap it. And the reason is, is because I think it implies that something related to that may happen in the game. Um, but there's nothing in the story that relates to doing things above board versus shady business practices. I think it's just a fun question, but I, I think it would work better in an ongoing campaign. So this, this entire story is based on... Um, Horde, uh, like a side sort of thing that's going on in a Horde of the Dragon Queen campaign that I'm also running. Um, there's these guys called the Pasta Boys. They all have pasta-related names, and they have a restaurant. And so they're doing Horde of the Dragon Queen at the same time that they're trying to run this restaurant. So that was the impetus for this entire adventure um, originally. And I think that asking, having them tell me whether or not they're going to do things above board or below board makes sense in there, but not really for the one-shot. So I think this is going to get scrapped. Um... What sort of food are you going to serve? This is obviously a critical question because they need to actually start thinking about it. So it applies it applies directly to the story. Um, they chose a diner uh, that serves mead um, with, at first they said pancakes and then they said mead pancakes. Um, and then I think we ultimately ended on, they're gonna do some sort of weird like mead slash pancakes breakfast combo um, with mead infused syrup. Um, and actually, these two things here would actually go down here. Um, could the answer take them on a different storyline? I think it could in an ongoing story. But for a meetup like this, a one-shot meetup, um, I, it can't because uh, we have to sort of stay on the rails for these things to work. Um, otherwise, we'll run out of time. And I can't really coordinate games out. I can't really coordinate like part twos and stuff. So. 
Um, let's see. So one of the one of the possible issues that arose here was that they initially wanted to be like a bar or just focus on mead. And at, and for a moment I was like, oh shit, because um, does that make sense with the story that I've I've written here? Like if they want to just make mead, like does that even really make any logical sense now when they go to meet Marma, who's this legendary chef? Like she's not a legendary mead maker. I don't even know what to call him. Um, distiller, whatever it is. Um, fortunately, someone came to my rescue and uh, they threw out the whole pancakes and the meat infused syrups thing. And then, th then we had a, a real connection. So that was good. Um, but definitely worth noting that that could have been a problem um, or at least could have weakened the whole storyline a little bit. Uh, could the answer take them on a different, ex like a different experience? Um, not really. I think I think the the experience can change in the sense that um, the dialogue would be different um, with like the NPCs and stuff, but the general story, general layout, and everything would remain the same. Um, <laughs> let's see here. So from there, uh, we talked about the positions that they each have in the restaurant. This was great because they define them here, and then they don't really get to use them too much. Uh, be, until the very end. Although um, the general manager position and the chef position did get used um, when they go to meet Marma, the legendary chef. Uh, she she has them draft a business contract between the general manager and herself to make sure that when they deliver what Marma wants, Marma will then deliver on the legendary recipe. And then the chef um, also kind of came up when he was talking to Marma because Marma was much more interested in dealing with a fellow chef than some of these other business, uh, some of these other people in the party. So that was also kind of a cool, cool connection. Um, we went with, uh, so general manager, chef, cook. Cook was sort of doing side dishes slash supporting the chef. Uh, the bartender, uh, server slash waiter slash busboy. Um, and then a bouncer, which was unexpected. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the bouncer towards the end. Um, and lastly, then I just asked them sort of a general question. Is there anything else you guys want to like tell me about your restaurant? Um, and they threw out that they wanted to have reasonable prices. They wanted to be like, they wanted to be, you know, be friendly to the locals and stuff like that, not gouge anyone or charge, charge a lot. They weren't trying to be fancy. They were going for that diner vibe. I mean, serving pancakes. Um, and they were open to, uh, someone mentioned something like giving out free meals to the needy or something like that. So um, again, this is, this is really, this whole section is really just supposed to kind of kick things off and, and get them thinking creatively. Um, I, I will definitely admit that it's sort of a risk because we're talking about new players, unfamiliar with D&D, unfamiliar with maybe stretching that creative muscle, but they did a great job. Um, and we'll, I'm, I'm curious to see how future, uh, future editions of this game go. Uh, some of the ones that I removed because I just felt like it was getting tedious. Um, what's your mission statement? Do you have a logo, motto, motto, or slogan? What are your hours of operation? Team building activities, a new staff orientation type stuff. Do you do weddings, catering? Those are all things I had initially added at the very beginning as possible fun things to ask, but I scrapped them all just because I think it would get a little overboard. All right, great. You're off and running, but there is still that one thing you desperately need to have a great opening night, and really a great restaurant overall, and that is a killer recipe. Something you do better than anyone else. Something that everyone will be talking about and draw customers from miles around. Ooh, actually, I should pause here because there was some, and I mentioned here, the connection here felt a little weak, and it, I'm not 100% sure why or what it is, but something you do better than everyone anyone else, something that everyone will be talking about and draw customers from miles around. I think the, there was one connection here that was weak in that they were sort of talking about creating a restaurant that um, was like catering to the locals, that was friendly to the locals, that gave out free meals. And this, this line sort of made it more than maybe they were imagining. Like that is for like a really fancy restaurant, but they weren't going for that vibe. Um, 
I don't know if that really matters. I can probably leave this unchanged and it'll be perfectly fine in other games. Um, but it, I'm going to put that in red as a reminder because it may be something that I want to adjust slightly. Even just just moving the language around a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, that's not something you have... Uh, okay, so... Let me reread it. Something you do better than anyone else. Something that everyone will be talking about and draw customers from miles around. Unfortunately, that's not something you have on hand or any previous knowledge of. But there is someone in town who may be able to help. It's your old friend Will Gilda, amateur alchemist extraordinaire who, rumor has it, knows of a legendary chef who may be exactly the person you're looking for. Um, again, just connection here felt possibly a little weak. My focus was on a recipe, but they had a, mentioned initial interest in making mead. We sort of got that sorted out. Um, and the other note I made here was that I need to kind of sell the motivation of finding the recipe a little more. Um, yeah, so it's possible that maybe this whole paragraph here just needs to be reworked a little bit. Um, add some emphasis on hey, you need to go and find Will Gilda. <laughs> like, make it really, really straightforward or something. Because what happened was, so in the next paragraph, you're currently in Roydricks, in the town of Spreedwall. It's raining outside with the occasional rumble of thunder. The roof is still leaking, but the fire is roaring, casting the dead bear's head in a monstrous shadow on the wall. What do you do next? And there was a kind of like, not a long pause, but like they all kind of looked at each other like, we don't know what to do next. And in my mind, I was like, well, I just, I literally just told you, you should go talk to Will Gilda. Um, but, but something about that, that connection between that paragraph and the next one just wasn't clear enough. Um, I did consider just being like, you're going to talk to Will Gilda right now. But I tend to avoid that sort of like, I don't, I, I don't like really pushing characters in that direction. I want them to feel like, you can explore the town for a little bit if you want. You can, whatever you, you want to mess around in the restaurant and do things, like I don't want to necessarily box them in that much. Um, of course, it's a balancing act between boxing them in a little bit, ver it, you know, to keep a one-shot meetup that has to be done in like three to four hours on track um, versus, you know, going off the rails and exploring town for half an hour. Um, but anyway, uh, I moved some things up, um, so they've got a few places they can explore. They can stay in the restaurant, do some funny things if they want. They can check out the blacksmith. I always like to give them a blacksmith option in case they want to, like, buy a special weapon or something. Um, the Hunter's Lodge. Um, the only really reason I added a Hunter's Lodge was, one, it's interesting, and I haven't put them in my villages before, so I, I kind of just want to experiment with it. And two, it could come in handy um, if I describe it in the right way as being like, hey, these people, it, this place is full of hunters and people that know the land really well. When they go talk to Will Gilda, um, she provides them some terrible directions that are really unclear. They could come back to the hunting lodge uh, as a connection and get a better map of the region. Um, so there is just a little bit of interesting connection there. Um, then we've got the potion shop. Uh, it's the potion shop that Will Gilda is part of under her master, Genwin Adenius. Um, they can buy some basic potions. I found an interesting website uh, that has some like ideas for common potions, which is perfect because up to this point, I've only had the potions recommended from the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the vast majority of them are like rare, very rare, legendary. I don't want to be. I want like just a big list of common potions, things that they could buy that are not super useful, but they're low-level newbie characters. They could still be fun. Um, so I'm going to use that, utilize that in the next game. I did not have that prepared for the game on Thursday. All I had for them was health potions, which was fine. Um, they visited Master uh, Adenius and attempted to haggle with him. Um, they managed to, and let me see if I should jump down here. Let me, let me jump back up to this in a second, actually. Uh, the last place that they could explore was the temple. They worship Malar, god of the hunt, fitting for the type of village they are. Um, and again, I didn't have much built out here. I was going to sort of wing it and see what kind of developed. Uh, they just they didn't end up going to the temple. One of the characters almost went there, but he got talked out of it by the other players. Um, all right, so drive them to Will Gilda. No, I don't. I don't 
I want them to have a chance to um, explore the town. So I'm going to leave that as is, or as it is now. Um, let's see, potential issue. Since Will Gilda is an alchemist, they obviously asked her for some special potions, which was a total oversight on my part. I just didn't really think about that. Um, so I was able to easily offer up health potions. This is where, when they asked that question, this is where then they they, they went to Master Adenius to see if they could get a deal, because health potions are normally like 50 gold apiece. Um, he, knowing, Master Adenius knows them, they're all locals to this village, so he was willing to give them a deal, 25 gold apiece. Um, they did some successful haggling down to 20 gold apiece, and then they um, sort of, uh, they convinced him to give two potions for free, um, and this was great. This was some fun role playing. Uh, it they were thinking outside the box, and they uh, managed to get two health potions for free by offering offering Master Adenius and his whatever girlfriend or wife or whatever it was um, a private table on opening night. He would even get like a little. Um, he would be like served specially, and he would have like a, an announcement given like. Master Adenius and so and so is here, and and no one else would get that and stuff. So that was they threw that out. That was totally their idea, and as a result, they got two free health potions out of it. So that was that was a lot of fun. They did a great job, um, and I think that actually does cover what I was going to mention here. Oh, okay. So this was this was one of the first places that came up uh, where I really appreciate Corin really playing. Um, uh, like being a good sport and playing along he tried to he was the like I think he might have been the paladin or the cleric and he he was very strongly religious his god was uh, Roydrick and um, Adenius was not moved at all by his you know his god or whatever and I, I sort of challenged him on it and in a lot of games I don't do that because Again, I don't want these new players who are really unfamiliar with D&D &D feeling uncomfortable, feeling like they're being attacked, kind of, or put on the spot or something like that. So I've been really hesitant and careful about doing this. This was really one of the first one-shots I've run where I've, I've actually sort of challenged players a little bit more. Um, and it went really well. He did a great job. Um, We'll see how it goes in the future. <laughs> I, I think it's going to really come down to making sure I'm paying attention at the very beginning and, and choosing the right person for some of these things. However, at the same time, I may not be able to do that because in this case, it was more of a role-playing thing. He put himself in that situation. Um, and then it really comes down to me and how I, how I manage the, the NPC character. Um... One thing I'm considering here is that Will Gilda could provide some special potions beyond the basic potions that are in the potion shop from that new website. Um, so you can see she basically gives them some health potions, but they're Will Gilda's mystery health potions. So depending on when, if they drink the potion, they'll roll a 1d10, and there are a variety of different things that could happen. Um, there's weak healing, there's uh, normal healing plus dark vision, normal healing one that does damage, plus causes loud, obnoxious vomiting, which, depending when it's taken, that could alert enemies. Uh, one with an extra healing. Uh, one that, again, does poison plus disadvantage. Uh, one that does healing plus advantage. One that just gives temporary hit points. One that just makes you drunk, but nothing else happens. So it's sort of wasted. And then uh, one that does extra healing. So I think I might do that. I've always thought those were fun. Um, players have seemed to enjoy them in the past um, because uh, I don't know it's just kind of a fun silly thing and they take it and they don't really know what's gonna happen so it's just like a, a lot of add some extra tension to the table um, in, a, in a good way um, let's see here all right so will Gilda gets uh, introduced eventually I in this particular session I really kind of had to push them because they they didn't seem to make the connection right off the bat. Uh, one of the players did, though, and he, he sort of helped along as well. Uh, but they did go talk to Will Gilda. Uh, they meet her in the local pub. She's drinking. Um, she is a kooky, funny, weird character. Um, they've known her for a long time. They've been friends. Uh, she mentions that she drank a weird potion today. She's not a particularly good alchemist, um, and she's seen purple out of just her left eye, and she's sort of hoping that it's not permanent. Um, 
she asks about the restaurant biz. They ask about the legendary chef, and that's when she sort of stops them. She's like, shh, it's a secret. And then she, um, this is where I can work in the vocabulary word, where Gilda surreptitiously slips out of the bar. Um, they follow her into the forest, and she sort of tells them this secret information about Marma, the legendary chef. Um, she... And uh, overall, it just, it was, it, everything went well. I think the dialogue was fun and interesting. Uh, they asked a lot of questions, and, and Mar uh, Will Gilda gave as much information as she could, but she also wasn't a great resource because she's, uh, she's just weird, and her memories aren't quite all there. She has trouble discerning past memories from past dreams and things, probably from drinking a lot of bad potions over the years. Um... And yeah, it was fun. Um, I really enjoyed her, her character. For instance, here I think this is her best line. She tells she's trying to give them directions on how to find Marma, and she says, uh, f "Follow the road east out of town towards uh, Mirath, uh, but then head north at the fork until you're hungry. Then head, then turn east and walk 300 paces backwards. That's important because if you're facing forwards, you'll walk too far. And I haven't done the math to convert the figures yet. There should be a cliff. He's really mean, but just ignore him and skirt along the edge." From there, it's just a couple of rivers to jump over, a few trees to climb, and then you'll be pretty much at her front door. Um, overall, I, I think the players enjoyed it. It was kooky and weird, and um, they laughed at it. Um, one funny thing is that they actually seemed to think that the whole cliff being mean was actually possibly an enemy or something, which makes sense. You're a brand new player. You don't know what to expect in D&D. Um, maybe this is part of it. Maybe this is some weird thing in D&D. Um, it's later explained that uh, there is just like the feature of the cliff. There's like a, an evil looking smiley face, but it's just a natural formation. It's not like anything sinister. But in, in, in Will Gilda's mind, she sees it as like a real living face that talked to her. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that quite made sense to the players when I described it. Um, further down here... Um, Oh, no, it was right below. So, you head off east following Will Gilda's scribbled and splotched map. The fork north is easy, but heading north until you're hungry is hardly an accurate way to direct someone. It took hours to find the trail east with multiple attempts leading into nothing, uh, but nothing but dead ends. Um, yeah, that should say, but... Um, I had them do investigation checks to ultimately find the, tr the correct trail. Um, but somehow you manage to find the cliff and skirt along its edge. Out of the corner of your eye, you see what appears to be a, a face, but it's just a jagged crack in the wall, and I, I described it and stuff. I was hoping in that moment they would be like, oh, that's what that's what she meant. She's just, like, crazy, right? But I don't think it quite, quite came off correct. Um, so I want to... Um, I want to completely, like, readdress these lines so that they're more obvious and um, yeah, more obvious and hopefully we'll get you know a laugh or something out of the players. Um, is this journey to find the chef for all the characters or just the chef and general manager? It is for all of the characters. Um, yeah, they don't split up. I, I do do that sometimes where people will split up, but it, it uh, I don't mind doing it. It's a little more complicated and it... Um, it leaves a lot of the other players kind of just sitting around waiting for their turn as opposed to them all moving as a pack. Um, so yeah, all of the players are heading off to find Marma together. Um, let's see here. So from there they cross a couple shallow rivers and are forced to climb a couple trees uh, to get their bearings. So again, that was sort of supposed to be like connecting it. Like her bad directions actually do kind of make sense. She just describes them in a crazy way. So... Um, yeah, I think that's everything there. Um, at this point, the thunderstorm has ended. Uh, Marma's hut is surprisingly large and sturdy looking considering its remote location. It's actually not like a hut out, uh, it's not, a, it's not like a hut out of the sticks. It almost looks like she may entertain guests or travelers, more like a lodge than a house. Um, there is also a, a mix of tantalizing aromas emanating off the house in all directions. I didn't actually read this one. Um, I just sort of described it off the top of my head, and I think that actually worked much better. Um, 
She doesn't answer knocks at the door because it determines if the person is new or not. So this is, again, sort of side secret information. Most likely the players will never, ever know that. But a really clever player or the pl a player who asks the right question may determine that, okay, so she, she goes by aliases. She Each of the aliases... The reason she does the alias is because depending on what part of the world you come from, you get a different alias. So she, if you knock on the door, she knows you're new. And if depending which name you call her by, she knows what part of the world you came from. Um, and so that's sort of building up this backstory that um, could be that could turn into its own one shot in the future. Um, let's see. Inside is thick with smells of cooked food, spices, and desserts. The shelves are packed with interesting looking supplies and ingredients. Multiple pots and pans are sizzling and boiling with foods inside. A uh, short, plump woman takes noti little notice of you and continues around the counters mixing ingredients and sprinkling spices. Um, prior to them actually getting in, there's another element here. They uh, knocked at the door. She did not answer. One of the players did a lap. Uh, looked through the windows, didn't really see much besides the interior of the lodge and messy, messy, like some messiness and a bunch of stuff everywhere. Um, they uh, actually kind of got hung up on entering the lodge when she didn't answer. And so after like a couple minutes of them being like, what should we do next? Oh, should we just go in? Oh, maybe we should like, can we figure out what's going on? I just had Marma like open the door and be like, hey, get your asses in here. Um, and in my mind, that's actually what Marma would do as the character. Like, that is her personality. Is She was, like, she's impatient. She's got stuff to do. She's very focused. She doesn't have time to deal with your nonsense. Um, however, the players actually interpreted that as me, the DM, trying to keep things moving. Um, and I don't know. That's not necessarily bad, but that is not how I wanted them to interpret that. Um, I didn't want them to think, like, like, come on, players, like, hurry up and do this. You know, I don't want it to seem like that. Um, I honestly don't know if there is a solution to something like that because that is how our character is. Um, hopefully, as they interact with her more, maybe then the dots connect and it makes sense, but it might just be a lost cause. I'm not sure. All right. Um, a random DM note here, Marma seems vulnerable. She's in a remote location, seemingly by herself. Um, but she she protects herself with um, a bunch of, like, constructs that are throughout the house. Um, so if the players did attack her, which they shouldn't, but if they did, she would be able to um, turn on the, the uh, constructs and protect herself, and they would probably be killed if they didn't run away. Um, it is possible that that could happen. I've had one group so far that went really off the rails during the Rust, uh, the Rust story. They killed a random person in the city. They went, half of them went to jail. One of them had to break them out. They burned down part of the village. Has nothing to do with the actual one shot. So I put some stuff in here like this because uh, it's sort of like insurance in case I get one of those groups again. <laughs> um, I also have a note here I'm going to put in red. I also just need to quickly draw the layout of the lodge um, so I know exactly like what goes where and stuff. I, I just kind of came up with it off the top of my head as I was as I was playing. Um, and I think it, it all worked out and made sense. Uh, let's see what else we got here. So Marma, I've got some details about her personality. She's focused, says what's on her mind, highly observant. Um, some physical descriptors, short, plump, little, thick, uh, plump, uh, thick glasses, curly hair. She looks like she's like a 50-ish, 50 years old-ish human. Um, sharp, business-oriented. Um, she's also very friendly. Um, they didn't trust her at first, but they, they got to know her and she seemed really friendly. Um, I had some general notes about possible dialogue, but these are all just primers for me. I actually never really look at these, these sort of dialogue elements with the exception of ones like this from Will Gilda where I'm reading like a very specific, like this is what she's gonna say to describe the, the directions. But for the most part, these, um, these are all just sort of like general, like this is how she sounds kind of things. Um, and I believe, yeah, so like even this one is a bit long and describes like the directions and stuff. I think I actually did that off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't think I read this, so. Um, they interacted with Marma. This was the second instance during the game where um, Corin and possibly, 
mostly Corin again, but possibly another player uh, interacted with Marma, and she was really like kind of like impatient with them, did some pushback. He was trying to like sell his god to her again, and she's like an atheist. Um, so she like was kind of mocking him and stuff. And again, he did awesome. I'm really happy that he played along, but we'll see how this goes in the future because normally I don't have characters like this that really challenge the players in that way. Um, so yeah, I made a note of that here. Interesting to play because she challenged the characters. I, I enjoyed playing her her character. Um, they hesitated at opening the door. Um, already mentioned that. Uh, Marma whisked away. I actually really enjoyed this moment too. Like they entered and started talking to her immediately. And um, the player actually said like, probably like seven to 10 different words before I like interrupted him. And I was like, Marma is in like another room. She just like literally walked away from you. And uh, they immediately sort of like that, that was great. Cause they, they got to know Marma a little bit right there. Cause they were all looked at each other like, whoa, that was unexpected. Um, that was, that was just fun. I, it's again, it's hard to describe these things cause they just happen in the moment. But um, I, I really did enjoy that. Um, the party explored her lodge for some religious artifacts and strange items. They were looking for suspicious things or maybe like a recipe they could steal. Um, most of that was not relevant to the story or changed anything about the story, but they did get to know Marma better. They got to know kind of what she's doing up here and that she entertains guests and she seems to be gets, she seems to get all these kind of weird gifts from people. Um, unexpected, like mysteriously getting all these gifts. So uh, just another element where players who are really maybe invested in the storyline, someday they're going to come back and get to figure out like what's going on here. All right, so from here, um, they have dinner with Marma. Uh, I intention intentionally added some suspicion. Uh, they... Uh, Marma serves them and they still don't really know if they should trust her and she sort of sits there and like watches them eat um, and they were all like kind of like they all perfectly kind of played it they were all like tentatively eating you could kind of sense the tension in the room um, and then Marma took some food herself and uh, and um, they kind of just got into talking business so why are you here what do you want okay tell me about your restaurant okay yes i can help you but you got to do something for me and this is when she describes what it is she's looking for i want you to go west i want you to kill these monsters get their their poison gland out of their neck make the poison inert bring it back to me i can make a rare uh it's a rare ingredient for a rare recipe that i want to make um you do this for me and in return i will give you a legendary recipe to help you with your mead pancakes stuff um, and then she writes up a contract the general manager signs it um, like I mentioned earlier and actually the chef also uh, had some good interactions her being a chef him being a chef they they there was a, a nice connection there that I liked um, and then and then they have a little montage where they party they party up a little bit with um, with Marma, have a good night, head to bed, and leave on the adventure the next morning. Um, and then from here, I sort of, again, just, I, at this point, I'm, I'm not really reading this stuff word for word. I'm sort of just, I know exactly what's going on, so I'm, I'm more just describing it, but I have notes here in case I need it. Uh, they march west. They march for a day um, until they reach a T in the road. Uh, they're on a fairly well-traveled um, trade route. Um, but the path that they need to follow is into a dark forest and it's narrow and old and there's a crickety old sign there um, that has a red skull painted on it. It says Splint Islands. Um, one element here that I might want to change is that I was trying to be realistic in terms of like how far away is this stuff? Okay, well, it would take like 24 hours to travel there. Um, and the problem with that was that I didn't want any random encounters to happen. And so, like, they slept through the night, and they talked about taking watches, and then I was just like, yeah, you sleep through the night and nothing happens. And I was like, that's not very... I don't know. I'm a little torn on it, because one, it, it felt unsatisfying. 
Um, it felt like we were just wasting time, kind of. But at the same time, I do. These are new players. They should be thinking about taking watches and having that conversation in a game. Um, so I, I sort of need to. Um, I sort of need to figure out what I want to do here. Um, most likely, this is again just another spot where I need to reword the the language a little bit. Um, you know, I could mention that there are noises in the night and the forest is full of noises and you can see eyes glowing in there. Um, but fortunately, nothing happens. You know, there's a more suspenseful way to sell that where they feel like maybe they're in danger, but whoosh, we're okay. Um, as opposed to the, I don't know, just the, I'll just say, lazy way that I, that I did it. Um, so I'm going to mark that actually as... I'm going to mark this whole section here as red because I think it really does need to be rewritten. Um, let's see here. The forest is thick and dark inside, and you immediately feel the presence of eyes upon you. Leaves, ferns, and branches press against you as you take with every step forward. Um, the trail is old, and you suspect no one has trekked this way in a, a very long time. Uh, for a while, you walk in silence, and only the forest sounds are around you. Um, I'm okay with that. I think I can do better. I think the descriptions there are, I would say, mediocre. I could I could definitely do better there. So I'm gonna put, put that in red as well. Um, so this is the, the next morning. They are trekking into this, this uh, dark, creepy forest. Um, this is the first time I asked them how they're sort of uh, um, situating themselves along the trail. Who's leading, who's in the back, who's in the middle. Um, and then that is relevant because they will eventually run into this Kuatoa, uh, like, tribal camp area. These Kuatoas are uh, base Kuatoas, slightly modified um, to have poisonous bites, um, just to kind of make the connection to the poison gland. Um, and when they essentially run into the, uh, the, the huts that they have along the coast, um, I have the person that's leading roll a perception check that kind of lets them uh, sort of determines where they stop along the trail and notice the Kuatoa. The only problem here is that um, they basically fought the entire battle on the very edge of the map um, because I had them stop like right at the edge. So I think what I'm going to do in the next game, and I think this will be an improvement, is they're going to roll a perception check. If it's a high perception check, they're going to be like in the middle. So the the huts are the huts are here, and the edge of the map is like way over here. Let's say the the edge of the black line here, this monitor here. Um, they're going to stop in the middle, right there, as opposed to along the edge. Um, with a good perception check, with a bad one, they're basically just going to stumble into the village. Um, I think that will work better. It'll make the fight more challenging because the fight was actually too easy. I think. Um, just by a little bit. And uh, it'll also give the uh, patrols or the, the reinforcement Kuatoas, there's two of them, that show up uh, behind them. It'll give them more space to work with. Um, but overall, the Kuatoa battle went well. They fought them, they killed them, um, took a little bit of damage. Uh, pretty happy with it. It was, I think it was a balanced fight. I think it will just be a little bit better if they're they're positioned a little um, closer to the huts. That brings us to an interesting situation that I did not totally understand. So I had described up to this point that when you kill the Kutoa, what you need to do next is gut them. Like cut them open, pull out the poison gland, and see if it's the right poison gland. Because Marma wants a very specific one. She wants, there are like young poison glands or like middle-aged poison glands, and then there are mature ones. And the mature ones are the ones that she wants for her recipe. They're um, slightly tinted green. They have this greasy feel to them, whereas the young poison glands are clear, and they're more like watery. Um, and I had like, clearly said, like, just, you know, cut them open, pull them out, and find them. There's no, you don't even have to roll for this. This is like a narrative element. And they, like for whatever reason, they got really hung up here. They, they were like, do we need to roll sleight of hand checks? Well, do I need to roll nature check to figure out like which one I should cut open? And I was like, no, just, you you don't have to do anything. Like, just cut them open and, and pull out the glands. I, I really, I do not, I did not understand why that happened. Um, 
-hmm. I don't know. I'm going to have to just keep thinking about it. Um, I guess I could possibly reach out to the players themselves and ask them, like, what what was it that held you up? Um, what held you up in this particular situation? Um, I don't know. It's a mystery for now. Uh, but anyway, I, I ended up having to really kind of like push them. Just be, I, I think at one point I was just like, no, it, it's okay. Just you guys cut open all of them. You pull them all out um, and you find the one you're looking for. Done deal. <laughs> um, at this point, this is sort of about the point too that, that it was starting to get late. It was um, 10 p.m. I could tell that there was at least two people at the table that were um, one one person at the table looked just looked like really tired, like maybe they had a really long day at work, didn't have sleep well or something. And then I, and then I knew there was one other player that was sort of like checking her watch, like hey, I kind of need to you know go home and I have work tomorrow and stuff like that. So. I'm always paying attention to those little signals, and this is when I started to kind of pick up the pace and let them know, like, hey, guys, I, I'm aware that it's 10 p.m. Um, let's just kind of get through the rest of this quickly. And and um, that was great, except that, I, I don't know, it still feels kind of like, as the DM, you feel like you're the, even though you know other players want to wrap this up and, like, go home and stuff, it ultimately still feels like it's your fault, kind of, or like you're the one that's rushing things, even though the players also kind of want to be rushed. Um, because the truth be told, I'll stay at that table basically as long as people want to keep playing. We have, I've, I've one of the meetups that I've run went till two in the morning, and I, I was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll stay here all night if you guys want to, because they were having such a, f a blast. Um, so, so the, yeah, I don't know. There's just, they, um, I sort of felt bad, but at the same time, I, I knew it was necessary. I don't know. Just a, just a weird DM moment. <laughs> um, that I, I guess the only lesson there is just be careful. You know, really make sure you recognize it and know that that's, that's the, what, the signal that's being sent. And then, and then maybe make it known to your players. Like, hey, I know what time it is. Let's, let's kind of pick up the pace. Uh, um, I think really what I should have said is exactly what I just said right there was, hey, I'm willing to stay here all night, but I know that, you know, people probably need to get going just so they know that I'm not the one like oh, I'm here for you guys. Um, OK, anyway, side tangent. Um, so from here, uh, we picked up the pace. I sent them into the cave to fight the final like mini boss, the tool um, that's lurking in its dark lair. This did not go well. This was by far the weakest point of the of the game. And part of it was we were rushing, but part of it was I didn't have this like really mapped out in my mind quite well. Um, I had them swim underwater to get into it, which brought up a big problem that fortunately someone saved my ass on. They were like, wait a minute, once we cover this um, poison gland with the like pus stuff from the fungus to make it inert, how the fuck do we get it out of this cave? Because we're going to get water and it's going to wash it off. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and fortunately, one of the players was like, oh, well, let's cut Let's like put it in our water skin and that'll like keep it um, protected. And I was like, thank God. Because <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I would have thought of that. I, I'm not sure what would have happened. Um, so one of the adjustments I'm going to make is that the cave does is not accessible by swimming underwater. It's just going to be like on the coast. They have to find it, and they'll just walk inside. Um, there might be some water inside, but they they will be able to walk inside and, and then come out. So avoid that potential disaster um, altogether. Um, and then I believe that same change will also resolve the tool issue. So I was imagining the tool is like one of those sea monsters that covers itself in sand and like lays silently. And then when a fish swims over, it's like and, and grabs it, right? Um, that's That was what I wanted to happen. But because they swam in and some of them didn't have dark vision and they were like, well, where's the fungus? Oh, it's all over the cave. Well, they, I don't know, the whole layout, the movement, it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then the chul, I just was like, well... I guess the tool just attacks them. It has to because otherwise they're just going to leave. Um, 
So anyway, if I do a cave that they can walk in, I can put the Chul in a position where they basically will walk like right over the top of him or next to him. That will trigger the, trigger the battle and solve all of these issues. Um, either that or the Chul comes back from a hunt and catches them in its lair, and then it's blocking the entrance, but we'll see. I will, I will definitely have to adjust the map that I've dr drawn up to this point to make that work. Um, okay, so then beyond that, they defeat the Chul. Um, we sort of had to rush through that battle. Um, and uh, they get the, the gland, they make it inert, they bring it back to Marma, she's all happy. Uh, they uh, Marma uphold, keeps up her end of the bargain. She gives them the recipe, trains them how to use it, and that finally brings us back to Spreedwall for grand opening night. Um, where they do some a mix of uh, utility type roles or, or ability checks um, to see how the night goes, and this is the last big, um, the big possible issue with this current story. So they go on this whole adventure, three, four hours long of doing stuff, and then the chef rolls a crit fail on cooking the fucking recipe, and I. I didn't, I, you know, in the moment I was like, well, you fucked up, man. Like, <laughs> you crit failed the, cooking the recipe. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you, the, it's ruined. Uh, it's, the problem, of course, is that the entire adventure then sort of hinges on that one role, which is probably just in, con like, in theory, that's probably just a, a bad thing to do. Now, again, I will clarify that the night ended well like it was fun that we were laughing like this it was not a disaster but one of the players did mention it he said wow it was like the whole adventure was almost like pointless because we fucked up the recipe now it ended with with basically the way that these roles go is that um i sort of just wing a a description of the opening night at the end so like so let me go through the roles really quick. General manager, Vol, she was rolling a charisma check at the beginning, and she's greeting the locals and seeing basically how, how warm is she being, how welcoming is she being, or do they feel like they're, you know, are, are, do they feel welcomed, right? She got like a mid, mid-range mid roll. I think she got like a, a 10 minus 1, a 9, because um, her charisma was minus. Um, the chef, of course, crit failed on his wisdom check. The cook... Uh, Lex, she got a pretty decent role um, that uh, she was making the side dishes. Uh, one possible thing here is that she could have maybe used her role to cover his role. Um, like, she comes to his aid, uh, and they basically have, like, advantage on it. Um, the bartender rolled a crit 20, um, so he sort of saved the night. He was working the bar. He was, like, doing, you know, sliding drinks down the table and... and being witty and having all this great banter and making people laugh and, you know, do you know doing shots and stuff like that, whatever. Um, so he sort of saved the night, and that sort of turned the whole thing into, like, ha, 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 like, maybe you guys aren't cut out to be a diner, but you make one hell of a, one hell of a bar, right? Um, so it wasn't a disaster. It sort of changed the whole, whole conclusion. But um, And then we also got a crit 20 on... Corin's role, he was being like the, the waiter, the server. He was all buttoned up, and, and um, I actually gave him a, an option. He could, have one, do a performance check, um, and that was basically like him being all like, you know, standing up straight and serving and all that sort of stuff. Or he could do a persuasion check, and he could basically convince all the patrons that the side dishes were actually the main dishes and that nothing, nothing weird was going on or something like that. Um, he went with the performance check, um, which was fine. I mean, I don't, the problem is, is he's, he's a waiter, so I, I wasn't sure how else to really describe him besides you did your job really well. Um, and then lastly, the bouncer um, uh, was that unexpected addition. The, uh, she rolled an in intimidation check. I wasn't 100% sure what to do with a bouncer position in, in a grand opening night. So I basically just had her be like, well, you're just, you know, you're keeping the people in order. Everyone's going crazy at the bar with um, Mr. Birdwoods. Uh, you're making sure that everything stays orderly and the night doesn't go off the rails or whatever. Um, and that concludes it. Uh, it changes the, the, the way I describe everything at the very end. Um, 
And yeah, so so of course the thing here that I need to explore, the biggest thing here is does it make sense for the entire adventure to hinge on that one role? Um, it wasn't a disaster. It was fun. There was laughs. But is it smart? Um, and if it's not smart, what is the better way to handle it? Um, should the cook come to the, to, to the aid of the chef? I mean, the other thing to remember is in this next game, the chef, most likely they're going to roll somewhere in the middle and the main dish will be prepared and it'll be perfectly fine. It's going to be really rare that the chef rolls a crit fail on that one roll. Um, it was fun that there was a lot ro like hinging on these rolls. Like after the general manager roll rolled a nine, everyone was like, "Ooh, okay, well it didn't start off so great." And then he he rolled the crit fail, and the whole table was like, "Oh my god!" Like, "Oh my god, that was the one roll." And then after that, every roll was extra extra important, and 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 like had all this tension and stuff, this drama to it. Um, so it's not like it was bad, but it still feels kind of bad. Um, I just don't know what to do here. Or, or, and maybe this is an experience thing. Maybe, maybe no matter how much I think about this, this is not the sort of question I can answer um, in a Google Doc, just on stream here. Maybe it's the sort of thing where I, I've just got to do this a bunch of times, run the story through the meetup, you know, and um, see how it plays out and over time how, whether or not I like something like this. Um, now that I say that out loud, that probably is exactly what needs to happen. Um, yeah. So that's it. Um, that is the story so far. I am going to be spending some time over the next Sunday, let's say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I think I'm running Wednesday, so three days, um, three part part of Wednesday, um, fixing this up, reorganizing it, optimizing it, polishing it, all that sort of good stuff uh, for Wednesday night. And then um, I'll probably run it a bunch more in the future because it is, I, I, it was fun. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Well, that's all I got. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll be streaming again tomorrow and uh, every day um, besides days that I like run D&D &D and stuff like that. So stay tuned and see you next time.